Hello, welcome to Organist Launchpad. I'm Isabelle Demers, and I teach organ at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Today, we'll be talking about pedal and manual technique. So we'll start with uh, pedal because, um, well, I think this is more interesting than manual technique. Um, so the first thing I would say, and maybe like the, the rule of thumb about pedal technique, and I can't stress that enough, you uh, really, really have to be relaxed. And relaxation is probably the one thing that will solve at least half of your problems with pedal technique. So if you can just remember that, uh, that's really the most important thing about having a good pedal technique. Uh, and this, this applies to your knees, your thighs, but also to your upper body, because your entire body is obviously very connected. And so then if you're very stiff up here, uh, obviously this will also create tension in your legs. Um, and then uh, just something like lowering your shoulders actually can have quite a big impact on, on your pedal technique. Uh, in the past, uh, I know that people like Marcel Dupre would actually teach by putting their hands on their students' knees to see whether they were tense or not. Uh, I feel that nowadays that would not go over so well, perhaps. Uh, but you can always try by putting your own hands on your knees. And then if you have any tension, you're going to feel it immediately. Um, another uh, sort of general rule would be that whatever you do uh, on the paddle board should mimic walking as much as possible. Um, Walking is probably the most natural thing that you do with your legs on a daily basis. And so whatever motion you might do that mimics that, um, I think will always be easier. Uh, for example, when you walk, you usually put your heel down and then you just transfer the weight to your toes and you don't think of that as two separate gestures. In fact, you don't even think about it. Uh, but so much of what we do on the paddle board is exactly that type of a gesture and yet I think we tend to overthink it um, so if, if you can really just think in terms of if I were walking on the paddles, so to speak, what would I do? Um, that really helps uh, quite a bit. Okay, so one of the important factors in your paddle technique is how you sit on the bench, which might sound basic, but um, people that have a background as pianist, as I do, uh, have a tendency to sit a little bit too far forward. And of course, on the piano, that's because you will put weight on your feet and then use the weight of your body to create more sound. Um, but obviously on the organ, you don't want to have any weight on your feet. And so uh, you have to sit a little bit further back. And really, I like to think of the distance between my knee and my hip and then cut that in two. And that would be about where the edge of the bench should be. Really, you should be able to move left and right like this and, and have essentially uh, no weight on your feet. Um, one advice that's often given to singers um, would be that they need to feel very grounded in the floor. And it's a little bit the same thing for organists. You need to be very grounded on the bench. Uh, so very often you'll see people sitting and they look like they're on nails uh, or on eggshells. Uh, and, and really you, you should be sitting as if you were on a couch, you know, about to watch a TV show or something like this. So again, relaxing your upper body is important. Um, you do want to have good posture, but it's always a little bit better, I think, if you try to just lower your center of gravity and really, really sort of sink into that bench. When you think about the position of your feet on the paddle board, like if you go for say a 90 degree angle, um, this is not very comfortable, I think, um, just because it forces your legs to be a little bit stretched. So instead of thinking of your knees as being in line with your, maybe the front of your foot, it's better if you think of your knees being a straight line from your toes. And so that would give you an angle that's slightly less than, uh, than 90 degrees, really. Um, and so that's, I think, quite comfortable a position and you could stay like this and feel very relaxed. Uh, there's, a, there's a technique of playing where people's knees are actually sort of stuck together. And I've even heard of people bringing ropes and chains to lessons to make sure that the knees would not move. That sounds a little bit uh, drastic to me. Uh, in that technique, I think your, your heels are also stuck together up until um, I think it must be like a fifth or something like this. Uh, I'm, I'm not crazy about this technique uh, because again, like if we, if we think back about walking, there's just nobody that walks with their knees together. I mean, you can try, it's very difficult and you look a little bit like a duck. Um, you, you might look a little silly. Um, so, so your knees are not designed for them to be like this. You know, it's, it's okay if your li legs are together, but your knees should not be looking inwards. They should be parallel. Uh, so even like when you go up this or something, it, yeah, it's fine to, to bring your legs closer, but not, not like this. And also not like this where your knees are very spread out, but looking outward. So just really parallel 
uh, but no more. In, in fact, w when you're playing just anything in general, uh, your feet should always be staggered. And I like to think of as if there were a line that was dividing the paddle board in two. And so one of my foot, one of my feet would be above the line and the other one would be backwards. Um, and so they don't really stray from this. So then if you're doing say like thirds, you know, um, one of them can be further forward, the other one backward. If you don't do this, obviously you're gonna walk on your shoes. Uh, and I think that's something that every organist know, but we tend to forget this. So, so sometimes it's good to be reminded of like not actually keeping your feet at the same level really, really makes a difference. When you're going left and right, you should also think about the position of your knees. Um, so we already said like maybe your knees should not be together but parallel. But then what happens when you're moving like this, or even if it's only one foot? Um, and a good example for that would be uh, the A minor concerto of Bach, where you have that pedal part at some point, a lot of repeated E's. So here the paddle board has a lot of springs, so it's actually not very difficult to do. But do you want to keep your knee in line with your foot, which would be more like this? And then in this case, my foot is rather flat. Or do I want to keep my knee more in front of me, in which case my foot will be tipped just a little bit? Um, I think it's easier, actually, if you think of keeping your knees in front of you and then just the bottom part of your leg acting a little bit like a pendulum. So going left and right, but without your knees following quite as much. And I think that's different from manual technique where like you wouldn't think of keeping your elbows by your body and then sort of doing this. That's very awkward. You would have your, your hands, your, your entire arm follow. Um, but I think for the paddle board, just to keep your stability, it's actually better if your knees stay closer. So in the case of the Bach, um, you know, it's something like this, right? So that works quite well, it's not very tiring. And I suppose that if I got really tired playing it, then I could actually move my knee a little bit. And then that would change which muscle is really engaged and make it easier. So it's also probably a passage where you could use some heel, which is not, not too demanding, I think, for the, the two pages or whatever um, length that excerpt is. When you are uh, moving up and down the paddle board still, um, you should think about which foot will be forward and which foot will be backwards. And so I think in general, the foot that is the outer foot will be back and the inner foot will be forward. So if you did a scale in thirds, you'd start like this. And then maybe when you get here, you'd start switching it. It might be a, a matter of preference. I think some people might find that easier. Um, but usually I think, I think it's easier because you don't have to stretch your legs quite as much if you follow um, that rule. If you are playing something like chords, and, and hopefully you don't have to play those very often, but it does happen once in a while, uh, you really don't want to keep your foot flat because if you do this, you're gonna have a lovely cluster. Um, so you really want to be angling your foot a little bit. Um, so in that case, the other part of my shoe is really up versus the inner part. Um, so then that way I'm not playing the note in the middle. Like this, right? And, and um, you know, really that type of playing is all about calculating which angle you need to be at. So if, you know, if I played that, or if I played even this, sometimes we think like, oh, I have to turn my foot as much as possible, and, and really you don't. I mean, you don't have to turn your foot 90 degrees to play this. You, you could turn it more like 45 and have the same result, and it's actually much more comfortable. Uh, so you should always see like how little motion you can do to get the same result. But yeah, if, if you play things like Salbon Ball, you know, how, how, much, how much do I need to move? Uh, what, what type of an angle do I need to have so that I can hit all these intervals, right? How much, how much do I need to turn? And then what is the bare minimum that's still going to work? Um, so as I mentioned uh, previously, this paddle board has an excellent spring. Um, so that really helps us quite a bit. Uh, so when you're playing, uh, you really just want to use gravity and just the weight of your leg for the paddle to go down. In, in organs like this that have excellent springs, uh, you just need to sort of poke the spring and then let it push you out. You don't need to be really bumping it. Um, or some people really push with so much strength. They, they tense up and then they push it, and, and you don't need to be doing this. Uh, the motion should be just vertical from your knee down, 
like this. This is the weight of your leg. It's almost like you're just poking at the bottom and then coming back, right? Uh, in Baroque music, uh, it will be sort of a vertical motion and your ankle will not move very much, right? Almost like your foot acting as a unit. Then if you're doing romantic music, your ankle will be a lot more involved. Um, will be in charge of connecting all of those notes. But the same way that your ankle will not be doing that type of motion, it will just connect horizontally the notes that uh, you're playing. I feel that very often with students, I'll see people trying to play with heels. And instead of playing straight down, they actually play a little bit diagonal, almost on the back of their shoes. And that's, that's not very good because it's a, first of all, it's a slippery part of your shoe. Um, but it also leads to your toes being too high. So even if you play with your heel, just remembering that the motion is completely vertical and not actually um, diagonal. So I guess one question that comes up very often is what type of shoes you should be wearing to play the organ. Um, so I have, I think, sort of a standard uh, women's shoes. Um, I practice most often in socks, and I think if you play without shoes, it's a bit of a different technique. The reason I wear shoes is because I'm short, and so having the heel is very important for me, especially in things like I did do this, for example. Um, that'd be very hard for me to do without the shoes. I think usually women have higher heels. Again, I think for a question of just of height. Um, you know, you have people like Jeanne de Messieu who played in high heels, and I always wonder, you know, if, if you play, for example, octave or something like this, if it's not easier in a way with heels that are higher because when you have to reach the other parts of the keyboard, you don't have to turn your foot quite as much. I think if you practice without shoes, actually, yeah, it's a bit of a different technique, and I think it really teaches you how to be completely relaxed just because you really have, I think, to work harder in a way at connecting everything. And, for example, if you played chords, you know, well, Having a heel, you don't have to bend your foot quite as much. But if I did the same, for example, without my shoe, um, you know, I could do it. But um, I have to think a lot more about where I'm placing my feet. And I have to just pull on my, on my heel a little bit more to make sure I play the, the notes together. And same here, I could, I could do this, for example. But I have to tip my foot a lot more than if I was wearing shoes. I think personally, shoes are better just because also it's a hard sole. And so if you're doing anything like, uh, you know, glissandos and all of this, you don't want to be doing this in socks unless you have very thick socks. It's, it, it hurts quite a bit. When I started out, I had very high heels. Um, and while this was easier for all of the motions between white and black keys, this was also very difficult to keep legato if I was doing a lot of white, 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 like this. You had to really move your ankle quite a bit just to get over that heel. Um, so um, I don't know how high those are, maybe like an inch and a half or something. To me, it seems to work. Um, but again, uh, with fewer and fewer shoe company, I feel that maybe in the future we'll have to start um, being very creative about what, what sort of shoes we're, we're wearing, or maybe we'll all end up playing in socks. So um, <clears throat> a, few, a few things to avoid. Um, so the first one I called with the students the Titanic, um, and that's because before it sunk, the boat went you know, halfway up in the air and then it broke in two, right? And so sometimes you'll see people play, and when they play the heel, the toes go up like this. And then when the toes go down, the heel goes up. So they mimic that type of motion. And that uh, creates a lot of tension. It, it really pulls on my leg. I, I feel these people must look like Hulk. They must have like humongous calves because they do this all the time. Um, but really, when, when you go down with one part of your foot, the, the other part does not need to go in the opposite direction. So if I go down with my, with my toes, um, I, I don't need for my heel to go up. It's, it's not even going to touch the notes. Even if I were on black keys or on white keys, it's not playing. Uh, the other one we call a uh, woody woodpecker, which is the people that are sort of like pecking from the ankle like this. This, this is not very good technique because first of all, you don't control the attack or the release, right? And also, as you can tell, it's making quite the racket, especially if you have some notes that have uh, noisy springs, right? And, and, and it's also like not, um, not very good for your legs. So, you should always go from your knee down with your ankle not moving so much, but not pecking at it. Uh, the people who do bicycle, um, you know, will be sort of playing like this, right? Again, um, a lot of noise, not, not a whole lot of sound, and no control of attack or release. So, so you don't need to be like bicycling like this. You should always play from the note with your foot resting on the key before you start, not just sort of jumping up and down uh, very randomly. 
there's people who uh, clearly must love fishing and things like that because they're always fishing for notes. And I think that's a technique um, that's for beginners where if you don't know where the notes are, you'll just go with your foot and sort of feel your way around. And, and the best place to feel, feel around is between uh, B and C and E and F, the two white semitones. That's okay when you're starting up and when you don't play very fast. As soon as you start doing things that are a lot faster, you really don't have time to be always looking for notes up and down. So I think this fishing for notes is, is not something that you should uh, keep doing when you're more advanced. Uh, and, and really, uh, if you don't know where the notes are on the paddle board, it's a bit like your hands. You know, you, you wouldn't see a pianist that would think like, oh, I don't really know where C is, so I'm going to feel my way around the keyboard. You just have to learn it, do a bit of slow practice, and then, and then you'll be fine. Um, but it's, it's sort of a, it's, it's, it's a technique for, for beginners that really you should drop after you've moved you know, past your first year of lessons. Um, still in the fishing or, or water area, the pe I call boating the, the people whose ankles are constantly turning and doing this. So you know they play a note and then their ankles are going left and right, tipping like this. Um, and that's usually because they push too hard and they have so much tension that their foot is doing this constantly. When your foot goes down, it should just stay there and not move. If you're relaxed, it will just rest on the notes and be completely fine. It won't have any need to do this. Um, the same way with uh, sweeping, and I'll confess that I'm a bit guilty of that one very often, but you know, people that play and they sort of like go, you know, up and down the paddle board like this every time they play, uh, you must have a very clean paddle board after. Um, but yeah, not, not really needed. You can just stay down there. Uh, helicopter foot are the people who play from very high and they sort of hover above the keys and so you know they'll they'll play from up here it's a bit like people who do bicycle um, but really when you're not playing your feet should be able to rest on the paddles so that you don't have all this tension keeping your legs up which is very tiring um, so so you shouldn't be hitting them from from up here um, <clears throat> and then I guess going back to my my Texan roots um, called cowboy, the people who have not learned where the notes are, and then they really open up their knees so they can see their feet. That's just really bad technique. So again, like learn where the notes are and you don't have to do this. But if, if you look like somebody who spent their life um, sitting on a horse while you're playing the organ, that's just not um, what, what you should be doing um, down there. Now talking about maybe more uh, specific techniques. So we talked a little bit about repeated notes in the Bach. But if we talked about uh, maybe doing like uh, more repeated notes, there's a few etudes for repeated notes. Um, for example, one of the Alcan etudes, there's a Demessio etude. So if you had to do quick motions like this, how to do this. Um, there's, there's many ways to do it, but I think probably the, at least for me, the easiest one is again, just sort of practicing landing on a note very softly. Um, and then when you, when you bounce up, then you fall with the other part of your foot, as if you were on a trampoline, you're sort of bouncing like this. Um, and, and your foot doesn't really move, it stays in the same place, right? And then you just need to uh, get, get it faster, essentially, right? Uh, I know there's also a technique where you kick a little bit, you know, sort of like kick forward. That works as well, except that on some paddle boards, it's very hard to control the speed at which this happens. So, and also, if you were doing many in a row, then you have to get your foot back again. So you kick up, and then you have to go back. So maybe not as successful. Um, but yeah, so, so I just, just practice sort of like doing this and bouncing, and then practice also landing on my heel, and then toe heel, toe heel like this. Uh, you can. Practice that to be completely relaxed by just lifting your leg and dropping it. And if you're relaxed, you shouldn't bounce. If you're not relaxed, you're gonna bounce, right? Uh, it's a little bit like the, the exercise for pianists where somebody holds your arm and then you're supposed to drop it. And half of the time, if you do this, the arm will save the air because people are afraid of the fall. Uh, so same thing that you should not control the fall. You should just let your leg fall on the notes. And then uh, you just bounce um, up and down uh, on that spring. Uh, chords we talked about a little bit. Um, I think uh, often you, you want to make sure that you're not playing those too far back. Unless it's something like a fourth um, on those uh, American radiating pedal boards. If you have small feet and you can take a fourth like here, for example, it's a little bit tight. 
If you move back, it's actually easier because the, the keys are a little bit closer together. So some chords that you could not take, like say here, might actually be possible if you just think of playing a little bit um, further back. Um, aside from that, for chords, I think it's just a question of having your foot completely relaxed. And one thing I really struggled with when I was working on those at first was my, uh, my toes curling up inside my shoe. And so if I can just remind myself to keep my foot completely relaxed and no curled up toes, it, it's actually not very difficult to just sort of relax into the chord. But if you curl up very often, yeah, it's very hard to play the notes at the same time. So you really need to have your foot completely relaxed inside your shoe for that. OK, so, um, so back to this idea of having the paddle board being split in two with one foot forward, one foot backward. This works especially well if you're doing things like chromatic scales. Right? You take just the black keys with one foot. You can go quite fast, and it's quite easy. But even if you were doing those with only one foot, uh, very often I find people play, and whenever they play black keys, they cover all of the black key with their foot. So they'll play this, and then their foot will go way up. So probably their toes are at the extreme, the forward edge of the black key. Uh, it's better, I think, if you think of the ball of your foot being on the edge of the black key. Uh, for, for two reasons. First of all, there's this minimum movement rule, right? So if you do this, you can't actually go very fast because you're traveling further. Uh, but there's also a bit of a pivot element, right? And so this is much easier to do if you're not, if you're like this. It's just not very comfortable. It works your ankle a lot more than if you're a little bit further back. So, so whenever you're playing and there's black notes, I think a, a good visual uh, sign would be that you, you should see part of the black key. If you don't see it because your foot is covering it, then um, you're, you're too far forward um, up there. Now, if you're doing something like, so you're coming from a black key and then white key and another white key, of course, you'll have to do a little bit of sliding, right? Um, but this, if you play it very far up there, then you have to do a lot of sliding. If you're really on the tip, you might be able to do this barely moving. Right? So you just have to turn your foot a little bit, and you don't even have to slide backwards. Uh, but if you are sliding backwards, remember that you should always play the note first and then slide. Not slide while playing, because that leads to sort of sloppy legato uh, most of the time. And then maybe just, uh, just one last thing. So um, I think we already talked a little bit about, about walking and how whatever you do mimics it. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of paddle etudes will call on this weight transfer idea. So, you know, for example, Falben Ball. Right, where there's variations like that, where you have just going from your toe to your heel or the opposite. Um, also this one, right, where, um, yeah, where, where you just have these sequences of two notes, um, one each. Um, so it's, it's really good to think that it's, it's all the same motion, right? It's just that, for example, if I'm playing this, in, in my going down, I hit first a black key, and then I just keep the gesture going, and I hit the white key with my heel. So it's one gesture, and, and instead of thinking like I'm going to push down with my heel, all I'm thinking is I'm going to relax my foot into my heel. Uh, and then it will become one gesture instead of two. Um, and I feel like if you can master this, actually, you've mastered so much of paddle technique because every time you have things like like trails or things like that, it's exactly the same. It's just that you put many of them in a row and the only difficulty is if you're tense, you become tired very quickly. Um, but, but if you are not tense, you, you can essentially do this for, for quite a bit of time um, and, and it doesn't become very tiring. Um, so I guess in short, I, I guess the best advice I, advice I can say is really relaxation is key. Um, and if you can't do something at speed, the way to go about it is to work at it very slowly until you can do the motion without any tension. And then after that, speed it up. I think sometimes we just try to go too fast and we try to have it at tempo immediately. And then we'll manage to do it some, somehow with a lot of tension. Um, but then depending on which paddle board you're playing, it's, it's just not going to be very effective. Um, so, so I would always recommend very slow practice um, and as little tension as possible. I hope this gave you some helpful ideas about paddle technique. Please join me for the next video where we'll be talking about manual technique.